Hey, we have 10 seconds left, y'all. Wow. Wow. The power of lights. Wow, you guys took the cue just like that. Hey, uh, everyone stand up for me again. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? It's what happens when you jump the gun too early. Hey, uh, just throughout James, the Spirit's been prompting me when, whenever I'm stepping up to preach for us to honor his word. There's so much exhortation to do good and please God. And we want to receive it with open hearts, a small thing to do, just like in the Israelites days where Josiah came back and the word got rediscovered and everyone stood up for Josiah, King Josiah, to, to say it and people to say, yes, I'm in agreement with it. That's what we want to represent. Just a heart posture of saying, hey, regardless of how we're coming in here, we are giving God, the Holy Spirit, the author of the word, a chance to tell us what to do this morning. Amen. Amen. Okay. With that being said, we're in James chapter three, and he is going to address the power of our words. Let's read together. Verse one, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses for it to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. In all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame on fire. It is a world of wickedness corrupting our entire body. It can set our whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Yikes. People can tame all kinds of animals. Birds, reptiles, and fish. Notice cats are not in here. But <laughs> no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing both come pouring. They don't just fall out. It comes pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out of with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. If you want a fresh filling... If you want to give a word that is from God himself, we have got to watch the words that we say. The power of our words produce one of two things, life or death. That's going to be our message today. God of creation, we thank you, Yahweh. You're the God of scripture. We honor you. We hold you in high regard and we come under submission by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know each and every one of our weeks thus far. You know the condition and posture of our heart. Soften us right now. Speak through me, Holy Spirit. Fill me and anoint me. Empower me to say your words. In Jesus' name, if we're on agreement, we said? Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Go ahead and take a seat. James the author of the book of James, who's the half-brother of Jesus. We've said this regularly. He was influenced by the book of Proverbs, and in it, it reads, 18 verse 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. Our words have power, specifically to give life or death. Whenever we open our mouths, it will be either or. This muscle in our mouth, it delivers something every time that we speak. It's like these Amazon delivery trucks. One, my oldest son, he's always like, look, check out that Amazon delivery truck. Check out that Amazon delivery truck. It sticks out like a sore thumb. They're everywhere now. And the, there's these new trucks. He calls them new trucks. They look like they're robotic. 
like they're a transformer. And whenever we open our mouth, we are like an Amazon delivery truck. We deliver something. It will either be a gift or it'll be damaged goods to someone else at their doorstep. And then it all depends on whether we say words of life or we say words of death. Church, just take a moment right now in your seats and consider, take inventory, invite God, the Holy Spirit to make you aware of what percentage you use your word count in. Is it death? No, (laughs) the innocence of a child. Or is it life? What is, do our words build others up or do they tear them down? What percentage, like genuinely, I'm going to give us a moment right now. Invite the Holy Spirit to give you a number in your thought life. What percentage are we currently using our words in? Go ahead and give me an amen if you have like a percentage in your head. Go ahead. Amen. Now turn to the person to the right of you and share the percentage that you use for death. (laughs) Harry got it. I'm teasing y'all. I'm teasing. Wow. Harry, you know me too well. In all sincerity, we should care what we say, not just in content, but how we say those things. Because the outcome of our relationships with our spouse, coworkers, friends, born again brothers and sisters in our small group, they will all be influenced by the words we say. That is the power of our words. And the reality is that most of our tongues need a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most of us need to consecrate our tongue for honorable use unto the Lord once again. Some of us need a full conversion of our tongue. Like we've been born again for two years, chronologically. And one of the last things that we've done is given permission for the Holy Spirit to sanctify our tongue, to wash it of impurities. In today's passage, James will address the nature of our tongue and is going to affect the methods in which we try to convert our tongue. Convert. Convert it from primarily using it as a delivery of death for it to be a giver of life. Amen? So in today's text, we're actually going to jump right into it. Verse 5. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame on fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. Not just one part of your life. Your entire life, from your emotions, from your thoughts, from your desires, all on fire. James uses the word tongue to reference language. He's speaking about our language. He says that our tongue is this tiny part of the body, but it causes massive destruction. Yesterday, if you've seen any of the destruction of that building in Israel, there were these small missiles. The effects of it was a great explosion that tore buildings down. Our tongue is used like that. And James talks about this power in a negative way. It's bringing death throughout all of this passage. Like nothing was positive, encouraging, K love. Okay, honestly, you know when you sing and you're like, that was better than usual? That may have been one of them. Let's read on and see the reason why he's focusing on the negativity of the use of our words. Verse seven, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue and the It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. James is calling our language, our tongue, evil, poisonous, and restless. He, He knows the moral default of our tongue. 
Uh, in other words, he knows that we naturally tend to speak or text or post things that hurt people rather than heal them. That we tend to want to defend ourselves rather than overlook an offense. And the rest of the biblical authors, they agree. In the NLT, the, word, the Hebrew and Greek word for tongue is used 78 times. And it, the majority, far vastly, is in the context of a caution to its readers that the way that we use our tongues is for evil. Look with me. These are just two out of the 78. Psalm 34, 12. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Proverbs 21, 23. Watch your tongue, your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. The biblical authors knew that the moral default of humanity is selfishness and pride. It's looking inward and self-preservation. We've said this for the past three years since our genesis. We've all been born into a condition. It's called sin. And it causes us to be those things, selfish. And the prophet Jeremiah received the revelation of the human heart when he wrote this. Jeremiah 17, verse nine. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Church, there is a greater chance whenever we open our mouths to hurt people rather than help them. To hurt people rather than help them. And it's not just in the content that we say. It's in our body language, in our attitude, and how we deliver a word. All of us have been affected by words that have been spoken to and over us. Even words of gossip and slander we've heard secondhand. And it just so happens that the ones, if we're honest, that, tend, that we tend to remember are the ones that cut us deeply. Words were spoken or texted to us that were like a spark that lit our forest on fire. They were like poison, as James says, to our thought life. They brought up insecurities where we thought we were confident. We heard, you're not as pretty as your sister. I can't believe that you're my kid. I wish I never met you. You will never change. And it broke us down emotionally and spiritually. Some of us, because of words that hurt us, question God's character, that he really is good, that he really does see us. And put into question, if we're really honest, if God even exists. Words have been used as a weapon to break marriages, break churches, break trust, break friendships. Words have been used to introduce us to unbelief, lies about our worth, and extremely low views of God. Words are so powerful that they carry a super glue with it, if you will. Whenever a word is spoken, it can catch our attention. Something along the lines of, you never get anything right. And it will go in one ear and instead of exiting out of the other, it sticks in our thought life. And the worst part is we're tempted to believe those things. James calls it actually a curse in verse nine. Read with me. Sometimes it, meaning our tongues, praise our Lord and father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Right now, James is calling us to be better, to do better in Christ because our words are actually affecting those who have emotions, those who have desires and those who have thoughts, image bearers. Verse 10, and so blessing and cursing come pouring, pouring out of the same mouth. The ancients, they understood that a curse was cursing a person by asking a divine being to impose harm or adversity on another's life. 
It's what we call witchcraft or divination. And James is certainly meaning this word when he says the word curse. It is, it, he's genuinely saying to the original audience and to us even today, turn away from that stuff, from calling on these spiritual beings to go promote adversity in another's life. It's a pagan practice called witchcraft. And if we think that that doesn't exist anymore, walk through a magazine stand and watch all of these witches that are on the cover of magazines. Why do people make cover of magazines? Because the culture has an appetite for that thing. Okay, one of the unique things of this church, and it's just by God's grace, is that people feel the Holy Spirit's presence in here. Why is that? It's because even in our age, in Western culture, everyone has an appetite for spiritual things. It's whether we're going to find them in the heavenly realm or in the dominion of darkness. Danny and I recently, we went to a restaurant in Omaha a couple of weeks ago. And we said, how can we pray for you? And the waitress ended up saying, well, you can pray for me, but I'm into pagan worship. So I was like, whoa, I met someone from the Bible days. Never had heard that before read about it, seen it in magazines. And she then talked about the friendly ways in which she interacts with the supernatural. And then how she has friendly interactions and talking with these divine beings and in Ouija boards and in seance circles and in different varying ways. We are all built to seek something spiritual. We will either deny it or find it in God or in the dominion of darkness. That's just how normal these practices are. But cursing, just to get us back, cursing is not just limited to witchcraft. The effects of a curse also happen, meaning adverse times, also happen when we speak death to someone by calling them an idiot, and then they start to believe it. Then they just start to believe the lie. In other words, when we speak death to one another, it can bring trouble, harm, and adversity upon the recipient of it. If they begin to believe it within our household, Danny and I's job half the time in correcting our children is correcting their language. Because we know that if they can, they have habits of calling one another names that are specific to their brother or sister. And if they're hearing that within my household about how they are dumb and I don't do something about it, I ain't doing my job as being the priest, being the pastor of our flock. You understand where I'm going, parents? We got to shut that stuff down immediately. Each one of you can understand. Parents and influencers, watch what we say. Parents and influencers, by the way, because we all have influence Just, you got to step back and see who you have influence over. You feel me? You tracking with me, church? Are you sleeping? Parents and influencers, watch what we say and how we say certain things. Because they're going to influence. They will most likely, those who we speak it to, has a great chance, because we influence them greatly, to start believing it. Call them clumsy. How they can never get anything right. Call them dumb and see what happens. They will live up to the words that we speak. Continually use critical words towards our kids or those we influence and watch them be critical towards them and especially towards others. Talk to our kids and those we influence with anger regularly and watch them become as miserable as we are. Our words affect those we influence. And here's the thing, if they don't reflect the words, meaning those we influence, that we speak over them, the other outcomes aren't great either. If they don't buy into the lies that we're feeding them because we're angry and because we don't measure our words, then they'll walk around as an adult with a chip on their shoulder, always trying to prove themselves. Always trying, even though no one said this to them in their nine to five, that they are worthy of living. 
that they walk around always constantly coming up with a defense before someone even criticizes them. Walking around with a chip trying to prove themselves. And that's exhausting. It's a hindrance to God's best for those we influence. And here's the best case scenario. Is that by the grace of God, Jesus breaks off those chains. That the enemy used our tongues to place on those we influence. And in that scenario, we've put those we influence into unnecessary spiritual battles and their identity and, de- and, and ha- handling their insecurities just because we did not measure our words. Church, those we influence and in our kids will reflect the words spoken to them in tone and in content. Right now, I can genuinely feel a little bit of panic in the room. If you're a parent, especially, you're thinking, ooh, I do not want to mess up my kids. Here's the thing. You've already made mistakes. And you are going to continue to make mistakes, just as I, with the words that we use that we shouldn't have. What matters most for each one of us is not just the words that we say, but the words that we pray. Look with me. Lamentations 2, verse 19. This is the thing we cannot drop the ball on, church. Rise during the night and cry out. Pour out your hearts like water to the Lord. Lift up your hands to him in prayer, pleading for your children. Our good, good father will fill in the gaps of our mistakes because they will be made. He will heal the the wounds that we give our children and he'll bridge over those, but we can't presume it. We must ask, we must seek, we must knock, and then God will answer. We must pursue God the way that this text talked about in desperation, like only he can answer, like only he can bridge the gap of the mistakes that we've made. And at the end of the day, if we're being honest, each one of the people we influence, they have their own free will, just as we do. There are plenty of kids who leave households and had words spoken over them of life more than death from their parents or other influencers. And they've turned away from God for varying reasons and turned away and rebelled against their parents. They have free will, all the more reason for us to let go of control influencers and parents and pray our way into God's presence and trust him to bridge over our errors. We've talked enough about the power of destruction from words. Let's go into the power of life. Proverbs 18, verse 21. The tongue has the power of life. We all remember words of life that were spoken to us, texted to us, or posted in which referred to us. We, we received them like a spark, not that burned down our force, but that literally lit up the dark night of our souls. Instead of poison, those words of life ended up being medicine. Many dead beat men have become God honoring men over history because words of life were spoken over us. Many insecure women now walk with confidence because words of life were spoken over you. Many husbands, even in this room, have produced and bore the fruit of the Holy Spirit because your brides prophesied life into you. Though you were not gentle, your brides told you you were gentle, that you were of self-control, that you were a leader, a spiritual leader within the household, all while you knew in your soul that you were not. But over time, we became that because we are continually hearing from the closest of people in our life that there was more for us. 
We didn't hear the criticism. We heard the encouragement. Church, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost wants us to use our words to bless others. There are people within our life that need not niceties. They need to hear God's voice. And the best way to build up others is to speak the Bible to them. It's by saying, friends, you don't need recognition, companionship, or an accomplishment to complete you. You are complete in Christ, who is the head of all principalities and powers in Jesus' name. That's Colossians 2, verse 10. It's saying, friend, stop questioning that your life was better and more adventurous and fun before Jesus. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore in Jesus' name. That's Psalm 16, verse 11. I can hear it right now, church. You want, just as I, to use our words for blessing more than death. We want to use our words to remind others of their identity. And we can't just float into those things. We can't just change the selection of our words for that to happen. Something deeper has to happen. Look with me. James 3, verse 7. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. James Bryan Smith, the author of The Good and Beautiful Life, he wrote this. The will actually has no power. The will is the human capacity to choose. In other words, our wills are influence, and then we choose what we most desire. And biblically speaking, the biggest influence on what we say is the heart. Jesus says it. Look with me. Luke 6, his own words. A good person produces good things from the treasury of good in their heart. An evil, produ- an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. Or for those of you who've been in the church quite some time, you know it this way. The ESV says, out of the abundance of the heart, our mouth speaks. I was waiting for someone to speak KJV to me, speaketh. (laughs) The words we say are birthed out of our heart. And Jesus guarantees, it's not like he's saying, hey, this may happen. He guarantees that our mouths will say what are on our heart. And when I say heart, I mean the Israelite original readers understanding of the heart, which is the Hebrew word lev or levav. And that means, you know, there was no separation of mind and feelings. It literally means that it was, the heart was your thoughts, your desires, and your emotions. In other words, our mouth will always say what is on our thoughts, our emotions, and our desires. It's guaranteed. Our words are like a mirror in that they're always going to reflect the condition of how we're really doing. If we're tired, our words will reflect that. If we're not resting, our words will reflect that. If we're having difficult times, our words will reflect that. We must process church and considering what's happening within our hearts, lies that we're believing, truths that we are cherishing and celebrate God for that, and emotions and feelings that are going rogue all over the place. And we must place them under the submission of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. We must also be aware of the environments that trigger these ungodly uses of our tongues. So for me, I notice that I'm short when when we're running late on me putting my kids to bed. All the parents are like, yeah, that resonates. (laughs) When it's getting late and we are 10, 15, 20 minutes behind schedule, I'm going to be very direct, very short, and very crude and very raw with my words towards my kids. And you know what the worst part is? I know that. You know what the worst part is? Is that sometimes I don't care. And you know what the even worst part is? I know that some of the last words that you say before someone goes to sleep are really remembered and I still don't give a rip. Why? Because I want me time. Not even we time in marriage. Me time. I want time to decompress and these kids are withholding goodness from me. Some of us (laughs) may have, some of us may have 
use sharp or short words when we're running late. Some of it has to do when we watch TV, Netflix, or when we're on our phone. Some of us use short or no words depending on what or what we didn't eat. Whatever our environments are, recognize them. Make those who affect those environments aware that you struggle with that. And then make a plan to limit it. It's just wisdom. It's just wisdom regarding uh, if, it's, if it happens or not. Here's the thing. We must submit it to the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, regardless of if we use that wisdom or not. So yes, James was right. We in and of our own power, striving in our own efforts by the flesh, we cannot tame the tongue, but Christ in us can. Christ in us can. The more that we give time to God, the more our words will reflect his heart. How many of us have spent time with God at 6 a.m. and the conversations, we, we felt his compassion towards us. We felt seen by him. We actually read to listen and to not speak angrily. And then we get into a conversation or we get into conversations at the workplace and we happen to consider the cost of what we say. We happen to be more compassionate. We happen to see others and affirm them because we've been seen earlier that morning. Are you with me, church? The born again life is all about relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's all about friendship. Church, we only have but a limited amount of words that we have in a day. A 2007 study published in the journal Science showed that we say on average 16,000 words a day. How do we want to use them? For life or for death? And we only have a limited amount of words that we actually communicate to a specific person with. How do we want them to experience us? Life-giving or a curmudgeon? Someone who builds them up or who tears them down? The choice is ours on what kind of person, what kind of words that we want to deliver. The choice is ours, whether we're going to be a church that resolves in our heart to say blessing and speak it rather than cursing. In Jesus' name. What I want to do is for those who genuinely know that a consecration of the tongue is what God's calling you to today, I want to pray for you. I want to pray blessing over you. I want this to be a day that you stick a foot in the ground, pivot, and turn away from being known in your household or in this church as a person who gives words of death and begins to give words of life. So if you wouldn't mind doing me the honor, let's pray together to close our time. Go ahead and close your eyes. Lay your chest your chin on your chest, and I just want to pray healing over the past use of our tongues. I want to pray blessing over its future use, and I want to pray for our hearts and its longings. I'm going to just read a prayer. Just follow it with me, and if it resonates with your heart, we'll work it through again, and you can say it out louder in your thought life. Father, make me aware of anything that has been contaminating my heart. I turn away from that sin. Substitute that with truth right now. Please forgive me. I consecrate my thoughts and feelings to you. I set it apart for your use. I designate my tongue to speak life from this day on. 
I choose to speak blessing, not cursing, in Jesus' name. Church, I'm going to work that through as our heads are still bowed and eyes closed. And as the Spirit prompts you, if you hear the word mouth, tongue, or heart, place your hand on that body part as we pray this together. Father, make me aware of anything that's been contaminating my heart. I turn away from that. Substitute that with truth right now. Please forgive me. I consecrate my thoughts and feelings to you. I designate my tongue to speak life from this day forward. I choose to speak blessing, not cursing, in Jesus' name. Ah, God, we're grateful for your presence, your joy and your pleasures forevermore. Bless us in our being and our doing. Fill us now, Holy Ghost. Bear fruit and gifts in our life to bless others. In Jesus' name, amen.